Thank you very much, Anya, for that welcome. And hello, everybody. Um, when people ask me to describe myself, I say that I am a recovering utopian. Um, that's partly because I'm an engineer by background. Um, and I'll explain why I'm recovering and why I was utopian in, in due course. But what, what I want to talk about today is uh, something that engineers never talk about and historians do, which is how to take a long view of things. Because I feel that we don't, at the moment, we don't, we're not taking a long enough view of our current, the situation we're in at the, at the moment and of some of the puzzles and problems and concerns that, that we have. Um, but the great thing about talking to librarians is that um, in my experience, sometimes they're very good at taking a long view. One of the people I know and like is Paul Courant, who was, I think he's now retired. He was the, li the, the librarian of the University of Michigan, which as many of you will know has, has huge, huge holdings of books. And he told me a really interesting story once, um, years ago, um, because the University of Michigan was where one of the father, where the father of one of the two co-founders of Google was a professor. And so um, the, the, I think it was Larry Page, but, but what it meant is that one of the Google co-founders had a soft spot for the University of Michigan. And when the two boys had the idea that they would launch Google Books, in other words, that they would, they would scan and digitize every single printed book in the entire world, um, one of the places they went to at the very beginning of the project was to Michigan and to see Paul. And um, the, the question they put to him was, would the, would the, would the university uh, make its entire collection available for the first bit of this project? In other words, could they scan every single book in the Michigan library system? And Paul agreed. Uh, so in a way he gave a, a head start to this huge, uh, this absolutely vast project. And he, he told me about um, a moment uh, after the agreement had been, had been signed, um, when the two boys and, and he were in his office and there was a lot of stuff going on. And then one of the Google chaps said to him, um, Paul, you've gone very quiet. What's up? And he said, oh, I'm, just, I'm just thinking, um, you know, about how we will make sure that these scanned images um, can still be used and viewed 400 years from now. And he said, because I'm a librarian and I have to think like that. Uh, and what you need to remember is that the chances of Google being around a hundred years from now are zero because very few companies last that long. And he said that the strangest thing was that he had never seen two young people so shocked because the idea that Google was not eternal had not crossed their minds. And I found that to be a wonderful, a wonderful illustration of the way in which if you're a librarian, then you have to think differently from other people. And in some ways, you really have to take the long view um, in a way that nobody in the tech industry ever does. Um, the kind of planning horizon in, in, in the tech industry is um, possibly lunch tomorrow. Um, but except for the very big for the very big companies, but they certainly don't think in terms of hundreds of years. Um, and, and yet they're embarked on changes in our societies, which are going to have an impact for hundreds and hundreds of years ahead. So my basic point is that I think it's important to try and take the long view of what's happening now. Um, and um, that's what I really want to talk about um, to this afternoon. Now, why is it worth taking a long view of things? Well, the best answer really, I think, is that it's a way of helping us understand the present. Um, 
I write a lot about this stuff. I have a newspaper column with a lot of readers and I get a lot of email and have a lot of converse, com, conversations with people about, about digital technology and its impact on the world. And what I find much of the time are, is that people are kind of baffled, puzzled, concerned, worried, sometimes excited, but there's, they, nobody feels they have a grip on it. Nobody feels they, they really understand what's happening. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's, that's a big problem. Um, I don't think, I think we can do something about it, but we can only do something about it if we look at these things from on, on a longer perspective. Because the current discourse about, about digital technology and its impact on society is characterized by something that the Berkeley sociologist Michael Mann famously described many years ago as the sociology of the last five minutes. That's, that's what newspapers do, that's what magazines do, that's what chat shows do, that's what radio news does, that's what TV news does, and so on. Um, and it's incessant um, in, 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 with digital technology, partly because the technology is constantly, seems to be constantly changing, and so there's always something to be concerned about. Um, I'm sure that um, some of you uh, listening to me have um, Apple iPhones, and therefore you will probably be aware that there is a new update for the operating system iOS that runs your iPhone. And if you've been kind of reading anything around this stuff, you'll find there's, there's a huge hoo-ha about a big change that Apple have implemented in version 14.5, which is the one you will have downloaded or will be downloading soon. Um, and the change is that you will find after you've installed iOS 14.5 that there will come a time when say you have, if you have Facebook on your, on your phone, when you want to launch the Facebook app, suddenly a dialog box will crop up and it will say, um, this app uh, is asking, is, is, is wants, wants to share some of your data with, with other apps. Are you content to allow that or not? And the anticipation of the industry is, of the, of the ad, the data broking industry is that many people when confronted with this choice will say no. Uh, and if they do, they, the, the prediction or the assumption is that the impact on this th huge industry, $350 billion a year industry, will be quite, quite serious. Um, because many people, if asked explicitly, do you want <laughs> your, your, your information to be shared? Do you want the, everything you've done on every other app, every, every site you've looked at uh, on the browser, and so on? If you want that to be shared, and sold and traded somewhere else in obscure parts of the internet that you know nothing about, they're quite likely to say, well, I know actually, thanks, I can do without that. Um, now, of course, the strange thing about all of this is that um, since 2013, um, Apple have been providing on their phones um, something called the uh, IDFA, which is um, a unique token identifying your phone, uh, which can be, which can be uh, accessed by ad advertisers and, and apps. Um, and if you were tech savvy, uh, then, and you realize that you could always go to settings and then to privacy and then turn it off. But you know, as well as I do, that um, most users of this technology, they always accept the defaults on their devices uh, and very few people would have uh, would have, would have opted to 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 switch IDFA off. Um, but now in the new the, the new version of the operating system, um, they're going to be asked explicitly to opt uh, to as it were opt in to to having their data shared. Um, and that's a that's a that's a big that's a big deal. But if you look at it from the perspective of the longer view then you say, uh, hang on, we're living in a world where one of the biggest industries in the world, 
and I'm talking about $350 billion a year, um, seems to be dependent on a setting on my phone or on our phones. It's not just Apple phones, of course. Um, how, 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 did we, how did we get here? This doesn't sound quite right, but this is where we are. Um, how do we get into this mess? And then when you think about this a bit longer, you, you remember that, that um, the vast, vast bulk, vast proportion of digital advertising is controlled by two um, giant corporations, Google and, and Facebook. And you say, how, well, how did, how, did, how did that happen? Um, and then perhaps you might start thinking, what, what, what are the implications for democracy of having two companies with this kind of reach and power who sound, control most of the digital advertising in our world? What are those implications? And the answer is, actually, the implications are not that good for democracy. The reason that is that democracy is not compatible. You can't have a democracy and you can't have uncontrollable powers loose in your society. Um, you can have uh, uncontrolled uh, huge um, uh, monopolies uh, or you can have democracy, but you can't have both. Um, and that's why there's a connection between um, your decision with your iPhone when you've updated the operating system to its current version and a much bigger story, which is what happens to society and what happens to uh, our democracy. So that's my, my basic reason for suggesting that we should, we should try and break away from an obsession with what's happening in the tech industry just now and to try to um, take a longer, a longer view of it. Um, I want to give a couple of examples of what taking a longer view um, would, would mean. Um, my first example actually comes from a book which some of you may have, may have read or encountered. It's by Timothy Wu, Tim Wu, who's a legal scholar at the University of Columbia and is now part of the Biden administration in his uh, antitrust and national security uh, team. But, but Tim is, is essentially a very distinguished academic lawyer and he, somebody, an academic lawyer who became very interested in early on in the internet and its implications. And a few years ago, he published an absolutely wonderful book called The Master Switch. And The Master Switch is essentially um, a history of the main communications technologies of the 20th century in the United States. That is to say, the telephone, the movies, um, broadcast radio, and then television. And as he told the history of the evolution of these, of these communication technologies, Tim discovered a pattern, uh, a cycle. And it goes like this. Each medium starts out chaotic, anarchic, very creative, full of promise and excitement and inspiring utopian dreams. Broadcast radio, Wu wrote, and here I'm quoting, attracted an extraordinary faith in its potential as the benefactor, perhaps even a savior of mankind. People dreamed that it would reduce the distance between citizens and a remote federal government, that it would elevate the level of public and political discourse and that it would lead to a cultured society. Quote, unquote. Nowhere in these fevered dreams, though, was there any mention of people cashing in. Well, of course, you will guess people did cash in. And what Tim Wu perceived in this, in, he perceived this cycle in the evolution of those 20th century technologies. The new inventions, he wrote, I'm quoting again, lead to a period of openness, excitement, and a feeling that nothing will ever be the same again. But the openness doesn't last. Closure is triggered by the arrival of one or more charismatic entrepreneurs at the point when the novelty of the new technology is beginning to wane and consumers have developed a taste for quality, stability, and higher production values than are being delivered 
by the nascent industry. And at the end of this wonderful book, Tim posed this question. Will this happen to the internet? Well, we now know the answer. It has. In one sense anyway, because the vast majority of the planet's users of this, of, of this technology, they don't engage directly with the network, but with a rather small number of services built on top of it. And what that means is that for most people, I would say nowadays, Facebook or Google or WhatsApp or Instagram or TikTok, they're the internet. And of course, in thinking that, they are mistaking a walled garden for the universe outside its walls. And therefore, they're not aware that the network that makes all these walled gardens possible remains much as it was when the switch was thrown to open it in January 1983. And the system based on the TCP IP family of protocols, which is the system we use today, was made available to the world. That network retains all of the affordances that so excited people like me when it first appeared, including its potential for democratization and human empowerment and human flourishing. The problem is that it has been captured by a smallish number of giant American corporations. When Vince Cerf and Bob Kahn, the two co-designers of the, of the network and their colleagues sat down to design the internet. They created effectively an architecture for what we now call permissionless innovation. In other words, innovation made possible by the fact that if you have a good idea, you don't have to ask permission to do it on the internet. And what they built actually in, in, in simple terms was a global machine for springing surprises. The first big surprise was the World Wide Web. That was developed in the late 1980s by a British computer scientist called Tim Berners-Lee working at the particle physics lab CERN in Geneva. He was looking for a way of using the internet to, 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 find, to, to store and find a way of storing and accessing um, documents across the whole world. Because remember, Stern, CERN is an international research lab. And so people come to work there from all over the world and then they go away having done their experiments and so on. And so documents relating to CERN experiments were scattered all over the world in, in, on people's computers and, 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 and in, in databases and so on. And Tim was trying to find a way of kind of managing the, the, the chaos of this. And in order, to get his, in order to get him off his back, his boss said, yeah, you can work on this for six months. And Tim went away and with a very small number of people, he invented everything you need for the World Wide Web. And then he tried to persuade, it, persuade his, his, his boss and CERN that it should pay attention to this. And, and CERN basically said, look, we're a particle physics lab. We don't do computer science, um, go away. And eventually Tim decided, well, if nobody wants it, then what, what I'll do is I'll release it to the world on the CERN internet server in January 1991, which he did. Okay. Now, just ponder that for a moment. This is a single person who has a really great idea. Um, it turns out that his employer is not interested in it. Um, so what he does is he simply puts it on the internet server and the internet server says, okay, well, this is just stuff with data packets. I can do that. And it does it. And the implications of that, that single, that single individual with a really good idea and the talent to, to visualize it and materialize it in software, he creates the biggest transformation, the most revolutionary transformation in humankind's information environment since Johannes Gutenberg. Now, that's what I mean by the capacity to spring a surprise because that's a hell of a surprise. And we, every one of us now lives with it every single day. Um, 
now. And there are other surprises. For example, um, same, same stories each time, fi um, file sharing, which was a terrible surprise to the music industry in its day. That was one. Voice over IP, what we now call things like Skype or, or, or the kind of calls you can make with WhatsApp or, um, any, or, 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 or a signal or one of the others. Um, no, there's voice calls across the internet. That was also one of those surprises made possible by the fact that you didn't need to ask anybody's permission. You just need to have the idea and be able to do it and hear it. So you get this, you get this amazing capacity. Uh, streaming video is the same, streaming audio, um, Netflix, all those kind of things come from this this network that that, that my generation designed, um, which was which was a basis for for having an idea and being able to 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 release it to the world. And so you get this amazing expansion of, of amazing explosion of creativity. And in those circumstances, maybe you can see why when it arrived, some of us entertained utopian dreams about it, just as people did about, about radio and the telephone in the early days. Um, now, with the 2020 vision of hindsight, given the world we now live in, that utopianism looks naive. Um, we, we didn't fully appreciate the power and ingenuity of capitalism to bend anything to its will. We were naive about the unscrupulousness of, of huge corporations. And indeed, we were also very naive about the somnolence and indifference of democratic governments uh, and the hapless gullibility of many of our fellow citizens. So we were naive. But the point is that utopianism is always naive. That's its unique selling proposition. And if we give up on it, then we're done for. There is a bit of good news here though, which is that that architecture for permissionless innovation that um, the designers of the internet um, came up with is still there. It's still working just fine. All we have to do is to learn how to harness it for what it can still do for humanity, rather than what it can do for simply increasing the obscene fortunes of a small number of people who have built uh, empires uh, on top of it. Um, so, in that, the, the reason one, one needs to, 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 to have a longer view is to understand, is not to lose sight of the fact that. Um, that there's a different reality and a different reality is possible and that it is a, it is a significant thing to um, that we might achieve which is to restore the internet to the kinds of things that it can do for a society um, rather than just the kind of things it can do to enrich a very small elite in a very particular part of the world and it's an elite that's very skewed demographically and in terms of gender as well so but all of that comes from thinking about Tim Wu's book, which I recommend, I really recommend it to anybody who's interested in how we got to where we are at the moment. Um, the second example, a kind of thought experiment about, about how to take a long view is to imagine that um, it's 2084 and you're a historian. That's assuming that climate change hasn't already done for the human race. But supposing there are still historians in 2084 and they're looking back on this period that we, we are now living through. And what do they see? Okay, well, here's what they see. They say, they see that in the 1990s, humans invented some kind of networking technology, which rapidly took over the world and led to the growth of huge super intelligent machines called corporations, which acquired apparently unlimited control over the societies in which these humans uh, lived. And as far as we can see, for a long time, the humans did nothing about the growth of these machines and the increase in their power. Um, but eventually, hesitantly and uncertainly, the humans began to strike back by trying to apply laws 
to develop and apply laws to control these machines before they became completely subservient to them. Now, those historians of the future have, will, will encounter a problem, which is that somehow records don't show whether the humans of our time succeeded in this venture or not. But they found records of what happened a century earlier, when humans of that time were faced also with a, an earlier species of superintelligent machines called things like Standard Oil and United Steel and Bell Telephone. And the attempts by humans to control those machines to a large extent worked. That's interesting because it, it, they did it once. Could they do it now in the in the two thousands? Who knows? And the point about this is that the argument these humans used, so the historians found, was that the thing they call democracy is incompatible with having powerful machines that are loose in their society, which are completely unaccountable. Nobody elected anybody who runs these giant machines. Nobody. And if you're aspiring to have some kind of democratic system, then you can't have unaccountable power. So in a way, um, the, 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 what's happening at the moment to us, you may have observed in the last couple of years is that finally, across the world, governments have begun to wake up, that there's a need to control these corporations, because if we don't manage to find a way of controlling them, then the thing we call democracy uh, is um, going to become a kind of a hollow joke. And what we've seen in the last couple of years in the United States, with a series of antitrust actions of various kinds, um, both by the federal government and now by the attorneys general of, I think it is 50, 48 states. Um, you see the kind of legal action to, to, to finally get a grip on this. Um, and then you see the same happening in Europe. Um, and even in the UK, where the only, the only bit of the British government that appears to be capable of rational action it's called the Competition and Markets Authority, has launched a series of really interesting investigations into the, um, the internal high-speed trading markets in, in data for targeted advertising. Um, and the strangest thing of all is that in China, the same thing is beginning to happen, even though the Chinese are not much interested in democracy, they are interested in not having uh, not having powerful corporations that are more important or bigger or claim to be more powerful than the Chinese Communist Party. So there are two ways, there are two kinds of ways of taking a long view of where we are at the moment and trying to understand it. Um, I could go on for a long time about um, the advantages of, of taking that perspective um, as a way of enabling you to um, understand or to have a better grip on things that are currently puzzling. Um, but I think I've talked enough. I could talk about democracy for a long time, but I'm not going to just now. Um, so I'll stop. And if you have been, thank you for listening. And I'd very, less, very much like to hear some questions or comments. Thank you. Thanks a million, John. That was uh, <clears throat> that was fascinating, um, and we do have uh, we do have some questions, um, and we can take some more there if um, if people want to put them into the to the Q and A. And um, we've had some upvotes on, uh, on on the questions that are in there already. Um, the top one here is: um, Was it intended that the internet would share ideas freely? And has it been overtaken by capitalist thinking or will it survive to freely share information? 
Well, the, the, the answer is that the internet doesn't have a view about anything as such. Well, the, 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 key, the key to it, strangely enough, is that when it was being designed, the, 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 the two co-designers, Vint Cerf and Bob Kahn, um, were trying to learn from the ways in which previous communications networks had failed. And they had failed partly because they had always been designed with a particular way of communicating in mind. Um, and so, for example, the, net, the telephone network was designed with, with voice calls in mind. Um, and there was, it was fine for voice. But when computers arrived and people started to try and network them, you found that a network developed for a telephone for voice is hopeless for, 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 for computers. Um, so they were, they were desperate to avoid that mistake. And the second mistake they were just determined to try and avoid was the idea that there should be some agency or some authority in overall charge of the thing itself. Um, and these came, they, 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 they fastened on two, two design axioms for the network. One of them is that there would be no um, overall ownership or control. And the second, second axiom was that we would design um, a network that was not optimized for any technology we knew about. For any communication technology we so they designed a very system a simple system uh, it did only one thing it took in data packets from one of its edges and it did its best to deliver those data packets to their destination at the other end um, it had no view at all it was completely agnostic about what what those data packets represented. They could be fragments of an email, they could be fragments of a voice conversation, they could be a pornographic film, you name it, they could be anything. So long as it's data, the internet did it. Um, so it, it didn't ever have a view about what kinds of content could 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 traverse across it. It was left to to the humans at the edges um, to to use it for whatever kind of content they wanted to, to push. So um, so, so, so in that sense, it, the, it didn't have a view about anything. It was completely agnostic about, 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 about what, tra what traveled across it in data packets. Um, but the thing, the thing that was utopian, uh, that encouraged utopian dreams were that in that case, anybody could use it for any purpose they could think of. And we've never had before, um, I don't think, a communications network that was quite like that. Um, the other thing is that the barrier to entry was was relatively low. If you understood enough of the technology to to create the thing that you wanted the internet to 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 handle for you, uh, you could you could you could do it. That's that goes back to my story about the web, which is Tim Berners Lee had this really good idea, and he was clever enough to 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 create the software and the protocols needed to make it happen. The network just looked at it and said, "This is just data. Off we go." Um, and and that 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 was the, the the wonderful kind of liberation of of the of the network. That it, that's why it was like nothing that had ever happened before. And it got to the point very quickly once the web was was up and running, where uh, you anybody could set up a website. They knew how to do it. Um, and then a bit later, um, people set up some some systems on the web for 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 blogging. And it got to the point where if you could type, you could become a global publisher. That's, that's where the utopian kind of freedom comes from. And there was nobody to say, look, you can't write that. You can't publish that because there are no gatekeepers. So that, that's why um, all of that is, is, what, is what made it um, a tool for human empowerment and for, and for liberation. Um, what, 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 of course, then happened is, is, on, is that on top of that open and free system and permissionless system, people built walled gardens. One walled garden is called Facebook. And Facebook is not permissionless. The only things you can do on Facebook are what Facebook approves. So you lose, you lose, the, you lose the, um, the permissionless bit and you submit yourself to control. Um, which is why, you know, now it turns out that's, that for various reasons, one of them being that it's, it's much easier to, it's much easier to write a tweet than it is to write a blog post. Uh, and, and it's much, it, it applies in all kinds of other areas, but essentially the wall garden, the wall gardens became seductively attractive 
to many of us for all kinds of good reasons, um, not least of which they were free. Uh, they weren't actually free because they, what, what happened is that the, the implicit contract was that we'll give you the services and we won't charge for them. But on the other hand, you give us your data and you enable us to track everything you do. Um, and, and then you get to the point where, um, where, where people want to express themselves in, 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 on social media in certain kinds of ways, which turn out to be allowable for a long time. And, and, and some, some of which are, are not. And you, you, you enter a world of an old style world of, of, of control. Um, and that's, that's what makes the difference between the utopianism and freedom of the, of the internet itself and what happens with the wall gardens that were built on top of it. Um, and the, thing I, the only thing I want to, want to say is that there is no reason, if you, want, if you want to become a global publisher, if you want to, uh, if, if you want to explain your ideas to, to as many people as are willing to read them the rest of it, there's nothing to stop you from doing it just by starting a, a blog, say. Dead easy. Um, so it's utopian capabilities of potential remain. It's just that most people no longer know about them because they think that Facebook is the, is the internet or Google is the internet or Instagram is the internet or whatever. Thanks, John. Um, can you see a solution? <clears throat> I can, I see a, can I see a solution? I think that there's a, the problem with that question is that it, it, it implies that there, there is a magic bullet. There isn't. I mean, there are some, it's, it's, it's become a very complicated system. But if, if you're dealing with a complex system, then what you, what you do is, first of all, you try and understand its complexity. And secondly, you, you, you use the analysis that you use of the complexity to see where are critical points that you could intervene, where it would make a difference. Um, in the case of social media, for example, the critical point is the business model that's used to fund the, to fund the system and to generate the profits. And that business model is essentially based on machine learning algorithms, which, um, which decide what people see, because what you see on your Facebook feed is not is not just something that it, it's not just what your friends have, have put up. It's a mixture of a whole lot of things, and that's curated in a way by by algorithms which determine what you are most likely to respond to. And some of that's fine and innocuous, and some of it is not. But but um, but it's the business model that does it. In other words, the, the more it turns out that the, the, the more inflammatory material there is, for example, on social media, in a strange way, the better it is for the proprietor of the open of the social media company, because that promotes user engagement, which gives more, more data that can be used to build even more detailed profiles of people and so on. So the, 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 it's, it's the algorithm and the priorities built into it that create much of the problem, not all of the problem, but much of it. Um, and if you want to do something about hate speech and all that other stuff that, that happens on social media, then it's, the, it's the, the priorities built into the algorithms, in other words, the business model of the corporation that runs it. That's where you go. That's, for example, what's very interesting about the Competition and Markets Authority investigation of social media markets in the UK, because they're going to start, they're looking, they're diving into the, in, in, into the, into the way that these markets function and the way in which they are affected by the machine learning algorithms that the companies run. But so, so you, you, you try and find areas where you could make, make a difference. Another area where you could, if you, if you really wanted to make a difference quickly, um, you'd, swi you'd switch off the retweet, retweet button on Twitter. Because the retweet button is the, is the thing that enables people to spread stuff without even reading it or thinking about it. That would that would have a dramatic effect, but it won't happen unless a company unless Twitter is compelled to do it, because its business model depends on people retweeting. That's where it gets that's where it gets the engagement that yields that that feeds the machine learning algorithms which builds the profiles which then guides the targeted advertising. So 
there, there's no single, there's no magic bullet, but there are intelligent ways of, of, of finding the critical leverage points in all of these, and they're all different. I mean, none of this applies to Amazon, for example. Different things apply to Amazon. Um, it doesn't apply to Apple, perhaps in the same way. So you have to have you have to have a general, much a much more comprehensive and sophisticated and versatile approach to this stuff. And we're only get we're only beginning to get there. We're at the very beginning of this now. And the big question is: Will we do it or not? Will we succeed? Because if we don't, then I think. I think we have to resign ourselves to more and more, um, a more and more disruptive and polarized politics, for example, and and so on. Yeah, really interesting. I actually thought about um, <clears throat> removing the retweet and possibly the sharing option, possibly getting back to traditional um, publishing media, news publishing. Um, interesting thought. Is that a, a gate then in itself? Anyway, um, so we've one here as well that uh, libraries were possibly walled gardens at one point, but are now very invested in open access. Is that also a utopian dream or is it realistic to try to take research back from, from corporate entities? The, the astonishing thing to me is that we ever allowed the academic publishing racket to to emerge and to thrive um i'm i'm a and also I've, I've i was appalled i've been appalled at the way in which the timid way in which um the the library and publishing world approached the whole question of open access um i i think it's utterly ludicrous the business model of of academic publishing is essentially would be familiar to the mafia um and i felt for a long time I don't want to have anything to do with it, um, but but I also realize that it, it, it's a compelling kind of racket because if you're a young um, early career researcher, for example, you have to it, 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 normally you have to kind of publish in 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 um, in journals with impact and so on, and most of those are, are controlled in some way. And and if you want to have open access, then you have to, you or your institution has to pay through the nose. For the privilege of publishing your own work. Um, I also think it's scandalous that, that research, which is funded by taxpayers' money, should should then be a source of, of pure profit for the publishers. So I'm I'm I am an open access freak, and I'd I'd really like to see academic publishers bankrupted. Um, that's my tactful view. Yeah, I think I think possibly a lot of people in the audience would have them um, would have a similar view, possibly. Um, uh, also related to that, um, Eve asks, do you think that the open science and open data in particular is a way to get back to a more democratized sharing of information and having more transparency in the system? A way of opening up some of the, the walled gardens. The, the, I mean, I suppose the, the answer is is yes. I'm a bit suspicious of transparency sometimes because I think it's used as a fig leaf for dodging accountability, um, often. Um, but but um, uh, and and I think that um, in in terms of open data in relation to the publication of, of research and so on, then if we want to uh, up to to reduce the already the replication crisis that we get in academic publishing in some areas we really need to make sure make it mandatory that when people are publishing work based on the analysis of, of data sets which they have accumulated um, then those data sets have to be made available for for review as well so um but i mean the, the nice thing is that in some areas of of academic enterprise i was thinking particularly of mathematics actually but in other areas as well um the, the whole of the field seems to have got that in other areas it's 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 different um and um uh, in general openness is better um I, there is there is a problem in relation to health data for example well you, and not only can you not you you have clearly have not you've got to make sure that that's 
the privacy of the people is, is protected, but the way in which a lot of the health service health health service and the health care industry is going is pretending that that if you quote anonymize the data, uh, then then it's all okay. Um, I'm not a security expert, but the, my, my colleagues who are are deeply skeptical that any 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 um, health care database can be anonymized. And there are all kinds of nice experiments now. There's a site on the web somewhere where you can you can type in um, a few details of, of yourself and then uh, find how many health databases um, actually could probably identify you or at least give you the probability of being identified. Um, there's a famous British politician who, who said that long ago because he, he, he's, um, he was a rugby player in his youth and he, has his, he had his nose broken six times. And there is there is no <laughs> there is no anonymized database that wouldn't enable you to find him quickly. Um, so you know it, it it it's a bit like the the thing about about um, magic bullets, um, openness, open data, and so on is is no doubt a, a good thing. But you'd have to look at each case and say, well, is is it really, and is that is that prudent and what are the downsides of it and the rest of it. I don't think the general openness as such. It's a bit like saying sunlight is the best disinfectant. It's a kind of cliche. And cliches are where the truth goes to die. Yeah, true. But um, yeah, hopefully there's, um, there's there's quite a lot of us working on, on those nuances. Um, yeah. To, to, yeah. Um, and kind of we're kind of working off the premise that as 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 open as possible as closed as necessary um yeah. to you know to 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 bring in uh those protections um uh next kind of most upvoted question is um neva sullivan would be very interested to know what um you think john of cancel culture and what or who is driving it Um, the honest answer, Neve, is that um, I'm not entirely sure I even understand what cancel culture is. Um, I know that's a shocking admission, but um, I'm kind of uh, I'm always. I mean, I, I, some of my colleagues are um, very exercised um, by it. Um, I suppose I feel I don't have a dog in that fight. So I don't pay any attention to it, I'm ashamed to say. That's the honest answer. Um, I'm, in, I'm in favor of cancel buttons on, on computers though. Fair enough, John. We, uh, we're all fans of uh, taking uh, null results as well here um, as, as also useful information. Um, there's a, there's a, sorry, Teresa, there's a question here. Do I own and use a smartphone? <laughs> yeah. no, the answer is yes. Um, um, I, I don't use it much for making calls, but apart from that. I mean, from my point of view, a smartphone is a very nice handheld computer, which for some reason can make voice calls at times. But, um, and, and just for the just for full disclosure, um, I, I use an, an iPhone. Thanks, John. Um, so Nolly Gas, do you think the takeover by two major companies, Google and Facebook, is evidence of an acceleration in technology or communications, or do you think it is a slow and insidious process that exploits public mistrust so that users will stay online for longer and possibly consult more sources to verify what they have read? Well, I I, I don't think that the the I, I don't think that. Um, the, the emergence of these two big companies in this particular area um, is, is it's not re it's not really a sign of an acceleration. It's it's a working out of the inevitable consequences of of network effects. Um, it just so happens that um, if the, the, the whole thing about about network network power is that um, networks become extraordinarily valuable exponentially um, if if they're used by a lot of people. Um, I remember years 
uh, and so that that explains why um, uh, there's there's not ever going to be a major an, another Facebook um, because the network power of two point two billion people being on the same network is just too too great for for um, um, a, a new kind of and there have been several many attempts to create Facebook type things and they they haven't um, they haven't worked because of because of network effects. So it's not really about acceleration as much as about um, the fact that in, in, there's no such thing as a normal distribution in, in cyberspace. There are only power law distributions where a few players get most of the action and everybody else is in the long tail. Um, and so they tend to monopoly in, in, in that area. Um, the, the, the thing about, but the other part of the question is, do I think it's a slow and insidious process that exploits public mistrust so that users will stay on, so that users will stay on longer for, online for longer. Well, that's true, but, but that's not true about mistrust. I think it is due to the fact that if you look at the way in which the machine learning algorithms work on, on social media, what you find is that, that, that one of the things they, 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 the algorithms are programmed to um, maximize if possible is the amount of time and amount of engagement that users have with their, with, with their service. Um, you know, uh, those of you who use YouTube, um, for example, will know that if you have the if you have the the, the, the button um, um, activated on, on the right hand side, the machine learning algorithm is 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 evaluating all the time um, how much what what you watch, of course, but also how long you stay on on things on the rest of it, and 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 it transpired that one of the biggest changes that I think Google made um, with YouTube was when, when they changed the algorithm not to um, not to prioritize just the kind of stuff you watch, but the things that you stayed longest on, the kind of thing you stayed longest on, and then you get more of the same, more of the same. Um, but the whole point of that is to make sure that you, that you, you stay on it. Um, Instagram is an amazingly effective, I don't, I, I'm a photographer, but I don't use Instagram um, seriously at all but but when i when i first looked at it i was astonished at how much time it wasted um and because i see people endlessly scrolling through it and i think that's a very successful example of of what we call surveillance capitalism in action in other words it's it's making uh, it it's creating content in a way that makes it more likely that you will stick with it for the time being and the more you stick with it the more data you generate um so I think that's more to do. I, I, I suspect that it's more to do with the design of 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 the of the um, of the stuff than it is with with mistrust. I mean, the thing people need to remember is that the applied psychology that went into the design of slot machines is the same applied psychology that goes into the design of apps. Um, the idea being that um, you 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 you, it, you you find ways of of keeping people hooked. Um, in slot machines, for example, um, if, if they're ones that depend on you getting six, six, six pieces of fruit in a row, then the, the algorithm in the slot machine is designed so that you get, you get five of the one in a row and you can see that you nearly got the sixth, but you never quite get the sixth. And the same is true if you look at your feed in, in, in social media. Um, you get you get a lot of what you want and expect, and then there's something else you're expecting and you didn't quite get, so you stick with it to see if it'll come next. Um, these are very manipulative. There's a wonderful book uh, called uh, with the title "Hooked," which is by a guy who specialised in designing addictive apps, and it's the same thing as designing slot machines. again for that John. Um, what do you think of how dependent the Irish economy has become on the on the tech business? I was hoping you'd ask me that. Um, I think this is this is a really interesting question and and um, I have a view on it which does I mean I love I'm, I'm an Irish citizen and I love I love it uh, and I love my country and but um, in one respect, I, I have become persona non grata in, 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 in Dublin circles at any rate, because um, 
Ireland's recent history changed in 1958 when um, Eamon de Valera stepped down as, as Taoiseach and became president and, and he, was he was replaced by Sean Lemass and, the, uh, and Lemass with, with um, Ken Whitaker, the, the, the great secretary of the Department of Finance, invented a new kind of, a new kind of industrial strategy for Ireland and it was to become friendly to foreign countries, to foreign companies. And, and, and to open up, open up the, the economy in that way. And that was a stupendous su success in a way, because it did it well and it was very effective and it changed the Irish society in all kinds of really good ways. Um, and that was fine for a long time because the companies that, that, that came were relatively innocuous. Um, but once the tech companies started to grow and they realized that they had to have a European headquarters and that Ireland was very, very friendly to companies in terms of tax deals and, and all kinds of other things, they came. And, and for a time that was, that was also great. It was, at least it was very good for, for um, um, the big law firms and accountancy firms and all the other firms that serve these, serve these outfits. Um, but the trouble is that in recent years, some of those companies have turned toxic and it's it's kind of embarrassing when when you have built a state on 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 being nice to foreign corporations and then suddenly of those foreign corporations turn out to have very very serious effects on society um they also consume an awful lot of um of of energy and they sell products which have um quite serious environmental um inflict quite serious environmental damage in the rest of it. So suddenly they, it's not quite as pretty a scene as, as in the old days when, when you, you invited in a wonderful German company called Liebherr to build cranes or whatever. It's different. Um, and I, I felt for a long time that, that the modern Ireland needs a better story and a different strategy. Um, but the, the crowning glory of this was when, when, when the European Commission a few years ago decided that Apple had underpaid tax to the tune of 13 billion euros. Some people, some people may remember this. Um, and of course, Apple screamed like blue murder and went to the European court to, to appeal the thing and the rest of it. The thing that I found was really funny was that the government that had been deprived of this 13 billion euros also went to Europe to protest against, um, against being, being required to collect 13 billion euros. And I remember thinking, this is really weird. Um, and I still think it's weird, but of course, the point is that Ireland is, has has put all its eggs in in the be nice to foreign corporations basket, and now some of those eggs have got a very strange smell. I said this once in the Irish Times, and an invitation I had to meet somebody was then withdrawn. Okay. Uh, that's uh, that definitely an interesting uh, <clears throat> piece of information there, John, as well. Um, I suppose I'm just conscious of time, so I might just try and collate some of the uh, of the questions here. Just just on that again, um, I suppose our, our existing legal limitations, anti-monopoly laws, privacy rights, um, and um, controls in general. Um, and um, VPNs possibly uh, in terms of combatants or, or solutions to uh, I suppose these monopolies um, are, 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 are any of these effective do you think or again well, I suppose we think that yeah, well the, the VPN one the virtual private network which is you know a t a, an encrypted tunnel that you use to communicate I, I think um, um, a VPN is, is a good idea, uh, and I use one all, all the time. You, you need to be careful um, about which one you choose. And in general, I would be very suspicious of any um, free ones. Um, you, 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 you have to remember that if you use a VPN, then all your communications are going through a single channel. And if that's run by an unscrupulous operator who can snoop on it, then it's 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 not worth a damn, um, but I think a good VPN is 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 um, 
is an essential thing. I, I run them on every device. I run the VPN on every device I use. Um, so I'm, I'm in agreement with that. Uh, if, if we're getting to the point where we need to some to finish trees, can, can, can I, Teresa, can I just come back and say, if you wanted to take away from all of this, um, the, the, the problems that face us, the things, that, the challenges that face us at this minute are, we have to recognize that this industry has to become regulated. It has been mostly unregulated up to now, and that's astonishing, but it has. It's, so it has to become regulated. So the questions, the, the big questions we have are, first of all, what would appropriate regulations now be like? Forget the civil bullet, bullet stuff. What, what would be the, the kind of the smorgasbord of things we, we're going to need? So what, what kinds of regulations do we need now to deal with these new, these relatively new kinds of um, um, uh, corporations? And then the second one is what would a good regulator look like? And again, that question is, is at the moment not, not properly answered. Um, it's not going to be like the regulators we use for conventional monopolies, like water and electricity and things like that. So it has to be more, more tuned to, to the task in, in hand. And um, so they're the two big, big currently unsolved problems um, for our societies in relation to this. Um, and then the second thing I'd say is that this problem is, in my opinion, much more urgent and important than than people or governments seem to realize. Um, I mean, what, what's, what's, what, we, what, we, what we've been watching over the last 40 years is the gradual hollowing out of our democracies. This started a long time before, 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 the te before digital technology, um, but it has, we, it has essentially rendered states um, increasingly kind of inept and, and under-resourced for the tasks that they have. And it's been fueled by an ideology which says that anything the state does is stupid and anything a company does is better. Um, and so we, our democracies are actually now increasingly fragile. Um, and if you doubt that, just think of what happened in the United States in 2016, and from which they had a very narrow escape with Joe Biden. And just think of what has happened in the United Kingdom, supposedly a mature democracy, uh, now governed by a crowd of corrupt clowns, um, in a very short period of time. So anybody who thinks that our democracies are safe um, is not paying attention. And what that means is that if you have loose and on, 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 on challenged commercial powers loose in such an environment, then you really, uh, you need to worry. That's a gloomy, a gloomy thought, perhaps, but it's what I think. Brilliant, thanks, John. Um, yeah, <laughs> keeping up with, uh, we've done an awful lot to think of. Um, yeah, and maybe we need to, uh, we need to use this as a start of a conversation to maybe start feeding, feeding our 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 knowledge and experiences up um, into influencing the students in the first instance, and maybe any organisations or or those with authority that we can um, to you know to get it. It sounds like that that we need regulation in place, and it's just regulation to anything that we have um, that we've seen before. Yeah. Um that's great. Thanks a million, John. Um I'm going thank to thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Um I'm going to call on Anya to, to wrap things up now. Right. <laughs> Back. <laughs> Sorry, uh thank you very much. Um John, thank you so much for that talk. It, it's it's been a really fascinating hour. Um the things that we don't think about often enough. Um it's funny, I was thinking um, at the moment, because we're in pandemic, a lot of librarians have been kind of under pressure to adopt technology quickly and maybe not as much as we would normally think about it. And it's really good to think about those things that um librarians traditionally um do have a long view and we should remember that and we do have uh, skills in terms of standards and metadata yeah. and open access that that it's important for us not to lose at a time like this when it's easy to lose and some of the the youngsters i was thinking that you were thinking of that couldn't see beyond 30 years or google not lasting forever they're they're our audience in an awful lot of cases and it is it is quite it's important to remember who we are in that 
Uh, so thank you so much for your time. I know you're a very busy man and it's been really, really valuable hour. So thank you. And thank you for the invitation. I really enjoyed it. Um, so okay. at that That's point, good. I'll leave. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very thank much. You yeah. Thank you. Bye. Um, uh, thank you everybody else for joining us too. I'm going to share my screen really quickly so, um, uh, sorry, so you can see what I'm talking about. But um, thank you, as we mentioned earlier, this is just the first of uh, seven, oh, already, sorry, uh, this is just the first of um, our seven seminars. Uh, so we really hope that you'll join us again next week. We have um, Dr. David Robert Grimes joining us next week uh, to be talking and he'll talk to us about um, uh, the age of disinformation that we live in where falsehoods and propaganda per 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 uh, perpetuate uh, much further and faster than they ever have before. Uh, so we hope uh, to see some of you along for um, that talk uh, next Friday on the 7th at 2.30. Um, and just a reminder there as well that um, the mailing list, the Lear mailing list um, is there to keep you up to date with everything we're doing. So thank you again to the Lear committee, a special thank you to Michelle Latimer of UCD for hosting us today. Um, and we hope to see you again next week. Thank you.